All right. Welcome to the second day of the IFI workshop. We are very happy to start the day off with Verena Kahn from CERN. We will be telling us about trends in AI for popular accelerators. Please go ahead. Thanks for the introduction and thanks a lot um, for joining me here to talk about AI for popular accelerators and um, also um, the trends within the community. So I start with um, a little motivation and I ask the question what? Can we do for accelerators? Now, um, I believe for, for a big part of the committee, um, uh, it was probably something like this. So, what um, DeepMind did for the magnetic control of token plasmas through deep reinforcement learning, while coming up with an algorithm to solve our hard, time varying, non linear, multivariate control problems with, in that case, um, deep reinforcement learning. Um, and then we also we have this algorithm to be a more elegant solution, like in that particular case, you have a simple control policy that you control in the electronics um, uh, compared to the conventional sort of uh, uh, control solution, which was much more complicated. Um, and also, of course, uh, obviously with, with guaranteeing the kind of accuracy that was, was required in the channelization. Now, um, Reinforcement learning, if you want, um, was in principle or is in principle an elegant and maybe also an ideal solution um, because you learn a dynamic of the system once and for all um, through trial and error, um, admittedly. And then uh, there is no more exploration of training. Um, uh, and in the best case, you kind of have one for crashes. Now, it turns out that reinforcement learning is not as much used, uh, used in, the, in, in, in the accelerator community as um, one would have thought, and there are several reasons for that. So first of all, um, uh, online training is very often not possible. Uh, okay, the algorithms are not sample efficient enough, but also because of the fact that they are actually living through trial and error, and uh, okay, they're safety constraints with themes that we're dealing with, and it's not so easy to put these safety constraints into the algorithm. But I think then uh, the, 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 the more serious reason is actually that um, for RM, also model predictive control, you need to build these type of algorithms into the accelerator design. So the systems, our accelerators would have to be built for RM. Now, we have really gone away very much from online training. We are switching to offline training. Um, so it means that we're essentially training on simulation. So, but for us, uh, this would mean that we'd have to have fast executing active simulation or digital twins, as we're calling them nowadays, and then the instrumentation designed with um, the control algorithm. Now, let's see whether these key ingredients also hold for the Tokama case. Now, they had accurate simulators, they actually trained in simulation, and then they did a zero shot transfer from the simulation to real. Um, he also had adequate non destructive instrumentation as state information. So here, actually, in that particular case, we're talking about 92 input states. And then, of course, um, we had the adequate algorithms, um, but these are essentially almost the bad cases if you want uh, a result. Now, when we do have these key requirements fulfilled, we can also do what people did for talk about for accelerator. This is an example here for a fully autonomous control with reinforcement learning for a small, low intensity linear accelerator. An electron accelerator, the example here is RS at, at DAISY. So it's six meters long. Uh, it's usually used to characterize out to short electron bunches for various applications. But people use this as a test bed because you can uh, get beam on it uh, relatively easily. So they trained um, uh, the, the, the control actually of the uh, end of the, the, the beam configuration at the end of the linear in position 18B and the, 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 the beam size in, in, in Asian B as well, um, uh, with reinforcement learning and simulation. So the measurement is done by, by screen operators or the users of the facility can uh, input their target parameters, and then uh, the agent would control three quarter poles and two spheres to achieve the target value. That is converged uh, in simulation, so they made it a little bit more complicated. Uh, through domain uh, randomization, such as also kind of a different initial conditions out of the RS scan. And then we use this in experiments um, against humans. Um, so they um, set up a competition um, by having two experienced human operators 
they were tasked to solve the same problem as three RN agents. Um, and uh, you can see in this plot here the results. Um, so in orange, you have uh, the performance or essentially the error with respect to the target parameter as a function of time for the RN agents. And in blue, uh, the ones from the unit operators. Now, uh, you can see that the uh, RL agents converge faster, um, but that the performance of the operators after 20 minutes, after much longer time, is slightly better than the one from the RL agents. Also, uh, the performance is much more consistent. It actually goes to targets um, much more smoothly um, than what the operators did. And um, the strategies were very different. So the, the operators here actually simplified the problem um, so they were working with two protocols at a time, for example, and the RL agent um, was in the hand to do this. Okay, and then anyway, actually one step further um, with the same problem on RS, they went towards talking uh, to the accelerators directly, or if you want to a large language model. So they used conversational tuning um, for the same uh, transit speed parameters at others, you can see here the objective. Um, and um, so the idea is, uh, was to use large language model, um, not to, to come up with the right tools to do this type of optimization, but to uh, actually do the optimization itself. Um, so of course, prompt engineering, like with all of these types of, of applications, uh, was very important. So they had the best performance with using uh, optimization uh, prompting, as they called it, which consists of an initial sort of explanation in optimization terms of the problem, also which kind of uh, control loops you can use, then you would have to feed it an input sequence of the um, actors, so these described control loops with the different possible values and what objective values you actually would get for those. And then you tell it finally what you should actually do, that you should come up um, with new values that are different from the original ones, that should have a sort of better objective function and so on. And also in which way it should uh, format the, the output. So then you'd hope for something like this, and actually new values, and I know, uh, ideally also sort of explanation of why you would choose those values. Um, so for example, it said here in the last line, um, I also kept the steering mechanism that is close to the last values for its movement. So that actually worked um, <laughs> with. Uh, uh, at least the best models. So they, they, they actually tested a lot of different large language models and the best uh, results they got with GPT-4 Turbo and the type of prompting called optimization prompt. So you can see here that uh, the protocols and the, uh, the series, they were uh, moved very smoothly uh, to get to, to, to the, 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 the target values. And you can see that they actually do reach the target values within the tolerances that we specified um, within the previous iterations. Okay, so this was sort of a, uh, an introduction. Um, just to uh, to illustrate a little bit um, the vision that we have of what AI could do for targets. It's essentially three things. Um, the first thing is autonomous accelerator. And here the keywords would be um, that we're looking for algorithms for optimal control and optimization, anomaly detection, prescriptive maintenance. Then of course we would also use AI uh, for optimi optimized accelerated design for future accelerators uh, uh, and, and even uh, upgrades of our existing accelerators. This would mean um, fast executing simulations that we could couple with optimization algorithms, differential simulations. And then the third point is of course that we would also leverage whatever is coming up um, in industry that was being widely used in the industry which are called generic AI for uh, efficient research and development. So AI systems for code development, knowledge retrieval, uh, and AI systems. And then I added actually another point here just recently um, that it's not just about the algorithms, but it's also about the fact that the accelerators need to be built for being able to use those. Okay, so um, future accelerators need to be AI um, ready accelerators, I think. It should not be any question about it anymore. But it's also very clear from uh, this, this, this discussion uh, that we have um, for preparing the FCC for so the future circular uh, collider that is being discussed um, for a potential uh, next generation uh, collider at CERN. Um, so there are the operation model uh, meetings already. Um, and they all started actually with um, 
coming up with an operational model that is very much like the business as usual, where the FCC would just be a larger MSC, would for scale, uh, using, for example, helicopters to review intervention times. Just for, for the people that don't know, so the FCC um, is tied with, with 100 kilometers circumference. Um, so more people uh, and more sites and, and so on and so forth. Well, it's actually financially excluded. So operating this type of machine in that way would be expensive. And then, okay, there is scaling. So the two ways um, we think how you do this. And then you could actually get inspired much more than how people are, are operating space telescopes. Um, so this would be, for example, hierarchical autonomous systems. The AI would be a key technology. And it's actually the management's preferred option. However, they would need to use the next 10 years uh, to be ready with adequate design choices. And so in, in that sort of uh, direction, if, if we really wanted to go for something like that. Now, this is another slide from these operation, um, operational model discussions for the FCC. Um, the way they're discussing actually this new equipment kind of, I think to be honest, it's, it's probably very much common sense. Um, but so everything would have to be or digital or remote control or very analyzable simulations would be key, fast execution, differentiable, and then automation at every level, um, automation across systems, automation within given systems, and all equipment designed with automation in mind. So auto configure, auto stabilize, auto analyze, and auto recover. And then in addition, because of the sheer size of this accelerator, you would think much more um like a space telescope again, that you would do things such that uh, with the, keeping in mind that you can't actually go there to fix it. And this is in um, things like maybe robotics and, and of course, in a classical way, redundancy. Okay, um, now we do have um, the existing accelerator complexes, all you know, in the various facilities around the world. You can see the CERN accelerator complex, with, which is very large. Uh, to some extent, also very old. Um, so this this particular machine here that is actually clearly nearly seen temperature change is from the fifties. Now, should we write the fifty old stuff? Now, given what I said just earlier, I think there is there should not be any question about it. It's to some extent our test, but but there are there is other motivation out there. I'll just give one here. Um, this is um, the ship experiment, uh, which is. Uh, uh, just been approved. Um, it is supposed to start operation in the 30s, and it will pose many uh, new challenges for the, uh, the existing accelerator complex. So, for example, it, we will need to increase the number of protons on target for the North area by factor five, while keeping the same physics that we're doing now at the same time. And then there are, there are there are issues with losses because of the increase in intensity that is on so. Now, to be able to do that, we will need to become much more efficient and also much more agile. Now, this was part of the motivation among uh, various various other uh, discussions um, that the management um, approved the creation of the efficient particle accelerators uh, project at CERN. Um, now, we just also got the the the, the budget approved actually just in June uh, during the June last meeting. And this project is all about automating the accelerator exploitation with the eye and also flex um, Here you can have this sort of a high level overview of, of what we are trying to do. So, as I said, focus is on automation to increase efficiency, reproducibility, flexibility, and performance. And so, um, part of these things that we'd like to, to address, um, for example, that we'd like to automatically and dynamically schedule beams. Which is done manually nowadays. We also want to revisit how we fill the LHC, um, which should be also automated and then standardized, but it should also actually have much less impact on the other physics that is all going on in, in, in the complex. Of course, we would like to automate parameter optimization and automatically contain drifts. A big thing is also hysteresis compensation. Um, so the reinvesting into this, such as we have the thermistic heat control um, and decouple physics programs from each other, decouple cycles if you want. Then we like to have fully automated cut commissioning. And then this the last point here is towards uh, what we mentioned earlier, this sort of FCC uh, kind of new equipment paradigm. Um, we'd like to start working towards this 
that we speak about ultimate uh, ultimate equipment that's not set up uh, ultimate thought analysis and recovery and so that. Okay, so now um, where is the community um, and what does the community think about these sort of things? To be honest, um, there are uh, these sort of considerations are actually uh, uh, being taken in, 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 in various labs for the, 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 the upgrades and also um, for, for the, the, the testing machines and facilities. And um, there is this uh, workshop series called uh, Malako Machine Learning Application for Quantitative Accelerators. Um, where all these things are being discussed, where we uh, actually inspire each other and also cross-fertilize um, each other. So far, there were four workshops. The next one is actually at CERN. And um, the last one uh, this year actually was in Korea. And you can see the kind of topics that were being discussed. Okay, it's anomaly detection, um, optimization control, which I'll come back to, to um, uh, straight away afterwards. But it's also an infrastructure and deployment workers. There were tutorials on okay, reinforcement learning, but also transformers for time series prediction. And this was in uh, particular, or this was about the story of um, uh, um, a compensating hysteresis. Now, um, what are the trends um, within the community? So it's um, good to see that the focus is actually shifting slowly from R&D to AI at scale with full lifecycle management. So the infrastructure and deployment workflows um, uh, uh, session was one of the longest ones. There is discussion about standards, but so we can share, for example, optimization problems across labs and do benchmarks. Um, and then non-trivial lifecycle management questions are being uh, asked as well. There is um, continual learning, um, and there was even a full um, tutorial about this. Of course, people are always using large language uh, models nowadays. Um, there is the model of Quartina that was fine-tuned on the papers of IPAC, so the International Quantitative Accelerators Conference. People are using large language models for logbook search, AI systems in the control, and so on and so forth. So there, um, I think there is a lot of uh, going on in the community. Um, but given the time, I will only talk, focus on, on, on one aspect, which is optimization and control. And Within that uh, session or within that, that, that uh, topic, um, I will also focus mainly on one type of algorithm simply because this fits with the current way of how we build um, accelerators the best. And actually, most people are uh, using that type of algorithm for doing optimization, but also uh, control with recrimination. So, the majority of the talks in the optimization control session was really on uh, vision optimization. So there's an impressive expertise in the community. Uh, I don't think that I'll have to explain other various parts to it. Um, but um, um, yeah, there is also a recent publication of a review paper um, uh, out now, uh, which is called Bayesian Optimization Algorithms for Accelerator Physics, which you can check out really to see uh, what people are doing. Uh, so it's kind of multi fidelity view of uh, for laser plasma accelerators, uh, safe opt. Um, where you can actually do the optimization with constraints, demodify it to plus convergence, and that's one. I'll give a few examples. And I start with um, vision uh, optimization with neural network mean bias. Um, and okay, the reason for doing something like this is to be even more sample efficient. Um, and uh, okay, including high information through just historical data. Uh, by conditioning simply the Gaussian process, um, this is uh, not, not very efficient, but what you can do is that you actually modify the prior itself. Uh, then you make the Gaussian process to become a model of a model, and you just have to see where you get this other model from. And okay, so what people are doing is that they, uh, they get this non-constant mean from simulation, for example, or uh, from a neural network of historical data or um, other Gaussian process. This is an example with uh, from live machine, an example from Atlas, the Argon Tandem Linear Accelerator System, which is used for the study of uh, low energy um, nuclear physics with heavy ions. Um, and the problem here was to optimize transmission to target five degrees of freedom. Um, and they use the neural net uh, trained on a previous run, in that case, nitrogen run. And they used this, this, this prior to get out of this. And, 
uh, for uh, optimizing the optical map. And you can see here that uh, with only a few steps, uh, we could optimize transmission to 100%, where it would have taken them much, much longer if we implemented them um, vanilla. The next example is from CERN here, uh, where we uh, use uh, Bayesian optimization to do uh, continuous control um, with the algorithm called adaptive Bayesian optimization. The, the idea here is relatively simple. So you use um, the Gaussian process to not only model um, the, uh, uh, the the objective function as a function of the control knobs X, but also as a function of T. Okay, so you use the uh, uh, a special kernel combination to 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 make this, uh, the training uh, be much more efficient. Um, but in the end, we use that type of algorithm to control the n times fifty hertz noise in this low circuit spill to the uh, area experimental hall at the CERN SVS. Um, so we can uh, control this fifty hertz noise that is coming from the Euro European grid, if you want, through the power supplies by uh, modulating the voltage of the main quarter poles at this, these frequencies to do this compensation. The only issue is um, that the load of the European grid is changing and therefore also noise is changing over time, so we have to go adaptive. Now with this algorithm, we, we, we can actually keep this under control and we can actually keep this uh, uh, under con uh, control um, with, uh, uh, to, according to the requirements of the experiments, where we say we have to be below 0.15 in normalized uplifts at these frequencies for at least 85% of the time. Next example um, is doing uh, Bayesian optimization with virtual objectives uh, using the algorithm um, info-based BACs. And here this is actually used uh, for the example of emittance tuning. So BACs is standing for Bayesian algorithm execution. You can find out more about this uh, I made this link here. Okay, emittance um, is um, important for many applications. It's, uh, uh, it, it is um, a measure of the, the, the phase space volume that the, your, your particle beam fills. Um, and okay, it determines, for example, brightness of the X-rays in FDLs, but also the, the luminosity in, in colliders <clears throat> and so on and so forth. The issue with emittance is that you cannot measure it directly. Uh, what you measure uh, is, for example, the beam size, and we use various techniques to this. Uh, um, it's um, particle scans, for example. So if you actually want to um, minimize the emittance by changing, for example, the solenoids um, uh, in, within the RF gun, um, you'd actually have to do, for each iteration of this solenoid that you do one of those particle uh, scans, as indicated here. Now, what's proposed uh, in this work here is that you actually learn the beam size model as a function of the particle settings um, and the solenoid setting uh, at the same time. And then you use this Gaussian process um, to do virtual emitting scans on the posterior samples of the Gaussian process as input to an acquisition function optimization. And then, you, so you track this out in simulation, you can see the result up here. In blue is uh, this Bayesian optimization using BACs, and it's of course much more self efficient than doing it the other way, where you have to do this multiple inquiries each time. Uh, the only thing is uh, that you have to think about is how do you know then that the optimization has converged? Um, because you do not have uh, the, the objective function evolution, um, which is the uh, that you input to do it directly. And what they propose is to use um, as a proxy for convergence the evolution of. The model itself will be a beam size model, essentially the error. And if, when this uh, uh, stabilizes, then um, this is an indication of conversion. And then you try to slide at LCMS um, doing the emittance uh, uh, minimization, continue the evolution in, in blue here uh, at the number of uh, beam size function queries. Um, so it, it takes about, if you want, uh, uh, 80 uh, of those, those queries, but interestingly enough, you get even to a better result than what you could have obtained doing the, 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 this, this uh, minimization with Fanchin. Okay, and our final example um, of, um, of the Bayesian optimization algorithms is using Bayesian optimization with model predictive control um, in the form of the algorithm GPIPC. 
um, and the reason why we're interested in something is because that this is a growth model based reinforcement learning if you want um, that is for a very sound decision. So what you do is that you learn the dynamics as a Gaussian process, and then you optimize for uh, the cumulative, cumulative reward in, in uh, virtual world. So it's another type of working with uh, virtual objectives. So, um, so what you in the end do is when you then have, uh, uh, train your algorithm is that you still have to do this optimization in virtual rollers at each iteration. But the way the algorithm is set up, it also allows to treat time varying systems and actually also easily uh, to uh, add in constraints. So that's why it's it's really interesting for us. There are many examples already for where, where people have tried this out. Um, just showing you one example that one of our colleagues uh, came up with doing now just this summer weeks. Um, and because I've talked about it already earlier, um, it's about the 50 hertz control for the SJ store extracted spill. So you can also actually solve this now with this type of algorithm in a reasonable time. Let's do it like this. This is the type of state that you have to define to make it fully observable. So we've tracked this in the past, like we should with D bar, and then it would have taken it works, but it would have taken way too, uh, way too many um, iterations to to train the algorithm. That is it not trained yet? There were the full sort of parameter space that you would need for real operation, but it's promising. So you can see here that it um, it it learns. It 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 uh, can actually correct um, beyond thresholds after some initial. Uh, training phase and 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 this is actually referring to solution. Okay, and um, now another uh, important topic uh, next to Bayesian optimization um, is more and more uh, differentiable simulation codes. Um, obviously, optimization algorithms do work best if you if you have the gradient information, but it's not just for this. I think having having uh, the gradient information. Uh, it's important for various applications that I showed just one afterwards. But there is now a collaboration uh, to work on a code that is called Cheetah, a <laughs> high speed differentiable green dynamic simulation. So this was started actually at DZ uh, in collaboration with KSG at, um, at Karlsruhe. And now uh, colleagues from Slack are also uh, joining forces. And hopefully, we, we, the, the, this collaboration can be increased very soon so that you can really kind of simulate more and more aspects of. What, what we're dealing with and the accelerators. Um, but to show sort of first results, you can use this, of course, to do gradient phase tuning. You just um, take the machine as you have it in the control room and you take the, the, the gradient simply from your, from, from your simulation. Or you can do uh, what we discussed earlier that you use um, Bayesian optimization with non constant prior means, where you use the mean as the simulation. This doesn't need any additional training or historical data. Um, it works essentially more or less out of the box with the simulation start time. Okay. But you can do many more things with this, and now it's starting to become really interesting. So if you have differentiable codes, you can, for example, do what Ryan and team did here. And I think this is really, really impressive. Um, so they worked on generative phase space reconstruction G6D. So these measurements are really important um, to know essentially the initial sort of phase space distributions, uh, which determine everything else afterwards, as you can imagine, but they are rarely done because they're very time consuming. It's just uh, one example here from SNS, um, where they took, uh, where they did one of those measurements, five million measurements over 36 hours. Now, what uh, Ryan and team came up with um, is they would use some generative machine learning model, which uh, proposes. Uh, an initial particle distribution, which you then transport to your backwards differentiable simulation code. This gives you then a simulated screen image, which you then compare with your experimental screen image in a loss function. And then you propagate the arrow back to update the weights here, such that eventually you have your reconstructed energy distribution. And now the amazing thing is that you tested this at argon weight to um, accelerator, and it took them only 20 measurements. Um, for full 60 reconstruction. Okay, so I'm uh, almost done here. Just one more slide about surrogate models. So this is, of course, very important also for control if you want for doing feedback control. 
And I, and I hope that already on Friday we'll talk much more about what the various efforts are for um, modeling with machine learning. Um, but just uh, one example um, that is also linked to the efficient project accelerator project uh, where we're talking about a series is computation. So, so here we, we, we are trying to build um, models of hysteresis and other effects, other dynamic effects such as eddy current. Um, we, we try to build these models from data on the measurements then. So we're taking really the magnets back to the, to the lab and we measure them. Um, we uh, model this as a forecasting problem where we want to predict the, the fields of the next cycle, giving sort of uh, past information. So the, the fields um, from the past cycle, the nodes of the current of the past cycles, and the future cycle. Um, so we do this in a sort of auto regressive manner. So we, we had first tests with um, using temporal fusion transformers. We can see here down here at the plot. This, this starts with very, very very good. Um, this is for using for modeling the SPS dipoles only. Um, so we will do really all main types of, of the uh, of the SPS um, magnets. This is sort of a pilot uh, project, um, and this is about the spill duty factor. So like uh, the, the kind of the spill quality um, and the spill quality uh, uh, is also affected by by history, uh, history history. So sorry. Uh, so depending essentially on the cycles you played before, it kind of uh, how you expect the beam changes, which is all measured through this spill duty factor. Um, and you can see here that uh, the green shaded area um, is the time when we have the compensation on that um, we can, it does not just destroy essentially the spill duty factor by switching it on and using this as a sort of a reference situation. If we put in MHC cycles in addition in the super cycle um, and do not have the compensation on the still duty factor drops, and then uh, we switch the compensation back on and it actually um, restores the still duty factor from the bottom. So this is all work in progress, but it comes soon. But I will conclude here with my main takeaways. So AI is changing how we exploit particle accelerators, and it will also drive how we build the new ones. The status, in my opinion, is that uh, there is a lot of state of the RDI in R&D, and uh, there are also now some small-scale operation solutions. The adoption of these methods is still slow due to various reasons. On the one hand, it is uh, the fact that accelerators need to be built for AI. Also, they need to be AI ready. Um, if currently, another obstacle is that it requires, I call it, a unicorn profiles. Uh, that will be there with the next generation, I'm sure, but it needs sufficient expertise in accelerator physics um, and associated technologies and data science. Many large language models will change this, such that people can work much more with concepts um, instead of uh, instructions. Um, and there is another thing that we'll have to tackle. Um, so for AI at scale, we still have to to uh, look uh, into infrastructure questions and the life cycle questions. This will, however, not come by itself. I don't think um, it, from you know, the grassroots sort of, sort of efforts, this needs to come from the top with um, strategic, ambitious projects. But I do think that there are some now. Thank you. Thank you very much for the nice overview. Your time for questions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I really wish I had almost decades ago trying to tune up accelerators. Uh, I also love to hear about some of the details. But, but, but another question is uh, I can imagine all of this being useful in industry with processes, assembly line. I'm wondering if you have collaborations um, with industry. We, we do have collaborations with, with industry, but we also do have workshops with industry. And I think this is almost more important um, because we kind of exchange ideas and, and, and experience them. Thanks, Marina. So can you talk a little bit more about making AI-ready accelerators um, in the sense of, are we talking about, of course, I understand kind of the interface that has to be different, but are we talking about systems that need you know way more diagnostic information or a different type of actuators? I mean, how how different is it? You said there's a savings 
from going in this direction, like manageable wants to go in this direction, but you know, how much more expensive would it be just in terms of the equipment to build accelerators that would have that capability? Okay, I'm not sure that I, that, that I will be really quantitative <laughs> um, with the answer here, but okay, on the one hand, it's, um, it's uh, I mean, basic things, like really making everything digital, that, that's one aspect, and, and okay, I think this is clear to everybody. But the other thing is now, like if if you look at at, at self driving cars, I mean, you need much more instrumentation than 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 we have now um, for some of the aspects. So I think um, if we if it, it is a, it's actually an opportunity. Uh, those people that build beam instrumentation and they come up with ways of 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 how to measure certain aspects, they will definitely not use lose their their jobs. Okay, and and as 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 Ryan also showed, I mean there is also this kind of the move towards virtual diagnostics, where we can actually uh, through clever ideas maybe make uh, better use of the things even that exist. Okay, hello. Um, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, the crack slide I was curious about was one where you mentioned Cheetah. Um, and I was just a little bit curious about, first of all, what kind of thing you're simulating there? This is like a CDD or something that you're working on and that's going to differentiate the two or something else? Um, and well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question first and then I might have a second one. So, to be honest, I don't, I, I, I don't know all, all of the details that are included nowadays in, in, in Cheetah. Um, but, um, okay. So, so um, they built it first for their for their own purposes, um, which was their uh, you know the, the test uh, linear accelerators, RF, and so on and so forth, where you can describe most of the uh, the the the, the, um, the the dynamics if you want through uh, actually linear transfer matrices. So this this is um, this is definitely in there. How 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 much we want we are have gone beyond this at this stage I'm not sure but the plan is to yeah to 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 go in in, in you know in, in all sort of uh, uh, directions I'm not sure that we will do big simulations with that sort of stuff uh, as well but uh, yeah if the idea is to go as far as possible so that we can make uh, use of uh, the transfer Got it. Okay, thank you very much. Then. Uh, this was really interesting. Thank you. I have a question which is sort of turning away from the main part of your talk, which was about you know how do you do these high dimensional optimization problems, and more to a single thing you had on the slide about AI assistance in the control room. And that got me thinking about I, I work on telescopes, not on accelerators, but you know, there's a very complicated integrated hardware software problem or you know system. And when things go wrong um, in that system and it falls on the floor. And the telescope operator or the accelerator operator expects to reboot the system and get it working again. You know, there's this extraordinary paranoia about not breaking something that can be very expensive or time consuming to fix. And so when that really, you know, you sort of work through the procedures and when that doesn't work, you end up waking up somebody in the middle of the night to actually get something, you know, to get expert advice or approval about what you're allowed to do to get the system working again. And I wonder if you, if there's been any thought about, are there ways to get AI involved in being that expert and what kind of safety protocols would really be involved in actually trusting an AI answer that it's okay to flip this switch back on or to make this move? Um, you know, what, how would we actually get to the point of training an expert or training an AI system to actually have that trustable expertise? Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, it's not that we have billions of these telescopes, you know, with, with lots of these faults and lots of experts. It's like, I don't know how one build the training system, the training data set uh, to do that. Now, I think this is a, it's a very good question and it will, will have to be answered. I'm not sure that I can answer this just now. So, but, but the, um, the idea is to, first of all, remove everything that is happening often. You know, and where you do not necessarily have to wake up an expert in the middle of the night. Um, and um, so the big bulk of things can be solved with 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 um, with, with with these sort of agents if if, if you want. And and then and then um, if there are still rare uh, occasions where you'd rather actually 
check with an expert in addition. To be honest, for me, being pragmatic, at the beginning, this is this is going to be fine. But then we will create the data set also um, with these sort of, uh, um, sort of rare expert interventions and uh, include those eventually as well. Now, how to make sure that this is really kind of, um, you know, that it actually tells you the right uh, or actually or or even 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 acts correctly. I think this is at this stage we, we haven't even started off thinking of. Any further questions? Okay, I don't see any. So thank you very much again.